Warning, this game contains content that might not be suitable for most audiences. Viewers' discretion is advised. The world began to unravel long before you were born. It began with Fogfall. Spectral mist bled from the seams where reality wore so thin it split. And from that fog emerged monsters, inhuman beings with unnatural powers. Some possessed language and intellect, others were mindless beasts driven by little more than the desire to slaughter. The cities fell and unrest spread, humans united in their fear while monsters thrived in the chaos. And then there's you. You're not even sure if you're human. You were born cursed with hands that altered the mind of anyone you touched. Choose your backstory. Oh. Okay, the unnamed. You were raised as an oracle in a remote temple. The priests claim your touch bestowed enlightenment, but a visiting mage revealed your curse for what it is. Following the mage's words, you fled in search of Cenobium. You regularly experience unnatural premonitions that rattle your body and the soul, an innate sixth sense that gives you a heightened awareness of the hidden supernatural presences around you. There's the Hound, where you were raised by society's outcasts, criminals who accept you when nobody else would. Your partner in crime, a friend since childhood, helped you steal enough money for a cure that then betrayed you. They left you with only enough coin to travel to the Cenobium, your last hope. You have sharply honed social intuition. You can survive and even thrive in the violent underbelly of any city. Use your experience of the underworld to get ahead. Then there's the alchemist. An exiled Cenobium mage took you in as a child, raised you as her apprentice. She seemed to take pity in your curse, but you discovered that she was cultivating you as a test subject. You fled to the Cenobium, seeking a cure. You are an experienced spellcaster with encyclopedic knowledge of alchemy, spellcraft, and history. With little observation, you can identify the subtle effects of magic. Honestly, I think I would go for having honed social intuition. That would just mean I'll be able to like flirt my way through everything. And you know that that's exactly what I'm going to be doing. I'm going to go for the hound. Your name is Lion. It's like the they them pronouns. Your backstory is the hound. Is this correct? Yeah, why not? Surely I would regret this further down the line. The wasteland stretches as far as the eye can see. There's nothing out here but death, the ever-present stench of decay, and countless sun-bleached bones cast like seas across the barren land. I could say death doesn't scare me, but to tell the truth, I am desperate. It's been two weeks since I joined the caravan, bound across the waste. Finding a group that would accept me was a trial in itself. As the rations grew sparse and my canteen ran dry, I began to despair. Then I saw it. What do your elvish eyes see? Iridia, the city of knowledge, one of the last bastions of humanity left in the world, and home to the famous academy called the Cenobium. All the world's knowledge gathered in one place. If there's anywhere, I'll find my, a cure for my curse. It's there. All that stands between me and the cure is a final stretch of salt-soaked waste, or so I think until I see the first tendrils of fog snaking beneath the wagon. Ooh, lovely. Is this... Fogfall? My stomach sinks at the very whisper of it. A silent storm, more devastating than fire. Dangerous in cities, but a death sentence beyond them. A thick blanket of fog engulfs us, smothering out the lantern's light. The wagon lurches to a stop. An eerie silence heavy as the mist falls over us. The only warning we get is a strangled scream. Stay back! No! The cry dissolves into wet gurgling. Then the wagon violently pitches to his side. I hit the ground hard, the air punched from my lungs. When I open my eyes, adrenaline lends sudden, awful clarity to the carnage before me. A trader I once shared bread with lies face down in the mud, the back reduced to long strings of torn muscle, gleaming gristle and exposed bone. Bodies litter the wasteland. I try to rise, but my ankle explodes with pain so blinding, white blooms across my vision. Only when my eyes adjust do I see a dark shape in front of me. Is this the first love interest? Can I, can I smooch it? Can I smooch the solace? Oh my god. A soulless stoops over the twisted form of the cavalier. I freeze, but swivels its head. 
a dozen bulging eyes twitch in my direction and blink as one. The soulless lets out an ear-splitting shriek and runs at me. But right before it reaches me, the beast barrels past, vanishing into the mist. Distantly, a horse screams in the dark. I need to move. Now. I'll head towards the wagon. I take cover beside the wagon where the air is thick with greasy smoke. Fire eats through the gaping hull, spluttering where lantern oil mixes with brackish water. Every person I see is dead or dying, except one. Oh, all oh, mother, forgive our sins. Guide us onto your hearth. We are worthy. We are worthy. The traveler grovels by the flames, their hands clasped above their head in fervent prayer. I glance upwards towards the gauzy lights of Iridia, just visible where the fog runs thinnest. I don't pray, but the sight of the city is all the reminder I need. I came too far to die here. Rapid footsteps echo all around me. I turn in circles, frantically searching the opaque mist for the source, but the fog fall twists and stretches around. Suddenly, the caravan's driver bursts forth from the fog. Our eyes meet too late. He slams into me, knocking me to the ground, and slips in a patch of mud. The solace falls on him as soon as he slows. It catches the driver by his throat and rakes his stomach with razor-sharp claws. He comes apart like wet paper, spilling intestines and viscera in the steaming tide. Fighting the urge to heave, I claw frantically through the slippery muck for a handhold. Ah, frick! My hand catches on the jagged edge of a rib jutting up from the water. Bandages unfurl around the gouge, torn deep into my palm. The pain's quickly forgotten when a hand closes around my wrist. Can you stand? Who is this man? The traveler leans over me. We need to run. They reach for my hand. I realize too late that my bandages have come undone. No, don't touch me. The sensation of their thumb brushing the back of my hand sends a shiver down my spine. All it takes is one touch, and in the space of breath, my curse takes hold. Hey, yo! Their lips peel back into a deranged grin. <laughs> no. I've seen this face countless times before. This is my curse. Madness of my own making. The grip of my hand tightens until pain radiates from my knuckles. Let me go! Suddenly, clammy hands crush my throat, choking off my breath. Die! 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 Spit bubbles at the corner of their mouth and flex at my face. The edges saw my vision darkens as my lungs scream for air. I will fight them off. My nails gouge deep into the traveler's wrists, but no matter how much blood I draw, they don't flinch. Oh god. The more I struggle, the tighter their grip grows. My pulse hammers in my ears, slowing with each thudding beat. This can't be happening. I'm going to die. Not because of the fog fall or soulless, but because of my own curse. Tears sting my eyes. No. No. Not here. Not like this. The hands drop from my neck, leaving me wheezing for air. My lungs burn with each ragged cough. My vision clears and the traveler's face takes shape, hovering inches from mine, lips still split into that macabre smile, even as blood seeps between their teeth. They give one last shuddering breath and slump over their claws hooked over their stomach. The soulless shoves the body aside and the glowing eyes stunning its leathery skin thin as though grinning. There's a flash of claws. Red spills across my vision. I thought there'd be pain, but as I sink into the murky water, all I feel is a grit of silt filling my mouth and the icy embrace of shallow water. Distantly, I notice an arm resting among an outcrop of reeds, mine neatly severed at the elbow. I should have taken both arms. Without them, maybe I could have survived. Maybe I could have had a home. Instead, I'll die cold, alone, and face down in a desolate wasteland. A fitting end for a monstrosity like me. Wait. Wait, no. If this is death, it's not as bad as I feared. The cold is gone, as is the choking stench of bog water. I could drift forever, cocooned in oblivion, until all thought and sensation vanished. No curse, 
Nobody howling at me in madness and terror. Nothing at all. The thought has a terrible appeal to it. But the next moment, I take a reflexive breath. Air pours into my lungs, then out again in a ragged gasp. <sighs> Feelings come flooding back. Warm cloth on my bare skin. A firm surface beneath me. A strange tang of sulfur in the air. Do not be afraid. Oh god, it's an angel now, isn't it? Oh, it's an angel, isn't it? I twist my head towards the voice. Tears flood my blurry vision at the bright glow of lamplight. Try not to move. The voice is calm, steady, and commanding. More importantly, it's a stranger's voice. One thought cuts through my mental fog. I have no idea who this is, and I'm completely at their mercy. S stay away from me! My words come out in a little more than a creaky whisper. I clamp my mouth shut, hating how weak and helpless I sound. No. No? Who is this? Uh, I, I will lay back down? I let myself slump back against a thin pillow, wincing when the motion jolts my head. Ah, uh, a cooperative patient. Thank you. The words swim in one ear and out the other without much comprehension. I pull the sheet up higher, wiping my eyes until my vision clears. Well, you're a sight for sore eyes. A stranger towers over my prone form. Warm light reflects off his pristine medical coat. I instinctively shrink back. That's when I notice I'm completely naked, except for a thin linen sheet. Naked, lying on a low cot. I have a pair of sharp golden eyes watching my every move. The man's gaze flickers to my exposed, unbandaged hand. I plunge my hand under the sheet to hide them from sight. Though it's too late, you must have noticed what they look like. Strange. Cursed. Inhuman. I brace myself for his inevitable suspicion and disgust, but his expression doesn't even flicker from that courteous smile. He just watches in placid silence as I struggle to make sense of my surroundings. Where am I? Who are you? Be calm. You are safe here. Whoever this is, he clearly has no idea who or what I am. Never been safe anywhere with anyone. The only person I've ever trusted betrayed me for a fat purse of coin. I scowl, pulling the sheet protectively around myself. Where are my clothes? The man's golden eyes narrow slightly. A sharp sigh rustles the paper in his hands. I see you, you are not to be dissuaded. Your clothes were torn to shreds when I found you, but I procured replacements. You mean this, like, thin layer of cloth you found? Neat. With a soft creak, he stands from his chair, giving me a better view of my surroundings. I seem to be in some sort of medical clinic. Bottles of silvery alchemical concoctions lie in the counters in neat rows. The air makes my nose twitch, a faint whiff of smoke and something distinctly metallic that I can't quite place. The doctor produces a large, dense bundle of cloth, which he sets at the foot of my cot. He's easily a head taller than most, and I have to crave my neck to look at him. Uh, thank you. I should be polite if I can, especially since I don't know who this is, what he can do, what he wants with me. Thank you. You are welcome. I will leave you to get dressed. With a curt nod, he leaves through the narrow door. I hear a soft click as the lock turns behind him. I count to three in the sudden silence when I don't hear any more footsteps. I reach for the bundle of clothes. An itch on my elbow stops me short. I reach down absently to rub at it, then freeze when my fingers meet a neat line of stitches. I know what I saw. The beast took my arm clean off. And yet my arm shows no sign of injury, apart from the black stitches poking through my skin. I gingerly flex my fingers, feeling my heart race at the sensation. This is impossible. I should be dead, or at the very least, gasp out my last breaths. I squeeze my eyes shut, waiting for the pleasant dream to unravel, to wake up bleeding out in the swamp. But nothing happens. The seconds tick by, and my arm remains resolutely healed, my surroundings pristine and quiet. In numb disbelief, I reach for the replacement clothes and begin stiffly pulling them on. They're thicker and warmer than mine were, with a black woolen cloak to go with them, but there's one thing still missing, my bandages. 
the golden-eyed man didn't leave me with any, even though I know he saw my hands. I slide off the bed and take a few unsteady steps towards one of the drawers. If this is indeed a doctor's clinic, there must be bandages somewhere. I start opening drawers at random, and of course, that's when the door swings open once more. Are you looking for something? I whirl around, clutching a thick roll of clean bandages. I try to step away from him, but my legs bump against the edge of the cot. Your caution is understandable, so if I meant you any harm, you would know. That doesn't make me feel any better in the slightest, but he makes no move towards me, so I quickly wind the bandages around my hands. The glowing scars and bottled skin disappear under a layer of clean white cotton. May I ask why you need additional bandages? I clench my jaw. I knew it would only be a matter of time before I asked about my hands, though the way he does it is strangely roundabout. Um, say nothing, glare at him, decline to answer? Uh, I guess I say nothing? Like, that's the most polite answer here. Like, holy heck. There's no answer I could give without raising unwelcome suspicion, so I just shake my head and finish tying the bandages in silence. I can only help if you tell me what ails you. An involuntary snort of laughter escapes me. Where would I even begin? Would he even believe me if I told him? No, best to keep my curse to myself for now and learn more about him first. Who are you? You may call me Kuras. Where exactly am I? Iridia which I assume was the caravan's destination. I could think of nowhere else for a group of travelers to go. Iridia, so made it to the City of Knowledge after all. Should I feel relieved? <sighs> all I can manage is a vague sense of increasing unease. How did I end up here? I brought you to my clinic, of course. You were the only survivor from the caravan, barely clinging to life. You needed immediate treatment. Which you provided. Yes. He says it so simply, as if I'm a small child and he's simply explaining basic addition to me. I frown and flex my fingers on my recently healed arm. Aside from being a bit stiff, it feels fine, thoroughly attached to me. You're saying that you stitched my arm back on? Pardon? A soulless attacked the caravan. It ripped everyone to shreds. It tore my... my arm clean off. B when I woke up here. I trail off. Bewildered, I've never heard of any magic that could heal a mortal wound like this. What kind of person could do such a thing? The doctor, Kuras, pinches the bridge of his nose. He sits back down in his chair, quite a long time. I do not know where you came from, but Iridia is the city of knowledge and deadly secrets alike. Information is power, and it's most unwise to give or receive it freely. Since you have refused to divulge your secrets, I will not divulge mine. I do not even know your name. I was just... You are new to Iridia, so I will overlook this specific breach of etiquette. However, you should not expect others to extend the same courtesy. Do you understand? He looks pointedly at my freshly bandaged hands. Though so I am to admit it, he has a point. I'm also a complete stranger to him, and if he is telling the truth, he saved my life. I take a deep, steadying breath. This time, when I speak, I sound a bit more like myself. Lion. My name is Lion. It is a pleasure to meet you, Lion. There's a little more warmth in his smile, his polite demeanor back in an instant. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for saving my life. I chance to smile in return. Even if he won't explain how he did the impossible, there is no doubt in my mind that I'd be dead if not for Kuras. Think nothing of it. I'm not sure if he's just being excessively courteous, but his words only raise more urgent questions. But I have to ask, why did you save me? You don't know me. The question seems to startle Kuras. I could hardly leave you to die in the waste. Assisting those in need is the very essence of a doctor's duty. I've never met a doctor who also handed out free clothes. My fingers find the edge of the cloak. There's a subtle but delicately embroidered pattern around the hem. I try not to think about what kind of price Kuras might ask for such well-made clothes. No, I suppose not. Forgive my presumption. I rarely come across so fascinating a patient. I blink. What did he just say? Yeah, I simply meant that few would cling to life so resolutely or brave such a perilous journey to Iridia. 
I could not help being curious about you, lion. His voice dips to a soft murmur, and he abruptly looks away from me. You're pretty curious yourself. I don't know what to say to that. I'll go for you're pretty curious yourself. You're pretty curious yourself. Am I? Well, I haven't forgotten about my arm. I wiggle my intact fingers at him. Clearly not. But you haven't asked me for any payment either. I require none from you. Travelers do not have an abundance of coin, and it would be unethical to leave you destitute in a strange place. I fall silent, unsure of what to say. Nobody would help horror like me for free. There has to be some kind of catch or trick, right? A loud knock at the front door stops our conversation cold and spares me from having to say anything else. Judy calls. Unfortunately, you are not my only patient today. The knocking grows more insistent and Kuras lets out a tired sigh. Please, wait your turn. So he says it quietly. The clamor on the other side of the door abruptly stops. Do you need anything before you leave, Lion? Oh, between the soulless attack and my miraculous survival, I had almost forgotten why I came to Iridia in the first place. I need directions to the Cenobium. The Cenobium? The look on his face is downright chilling. He pauses, choosing his words with cold deliberation when he speaks again. Whatever you seek, it is very unlikely you will find it there. The Cenobium's gate opens for precious few visitors. Even if they did, you would not like what you found inside. My heart sings. Is he saying that I came all this way for nothing? Risk life and limb for nothing? No, that can't be it. I've only just arrived and Iridia is the biggest city still standing. There has to be a cure for me here. <sighs> then if not the Cenobium, where would you suggest? Do you know anyone else in Iridia? I shake my head. Then I suggest a local guide. Head to the Westwick and ask for Leander. Excuse me, the wet what? <laughs> the wet wick. Oh, Wick, Wick, I, I I totally heard you right the first time. Yes, Wick, Wick, Doctor, yes, the wet Wick. Yeah. He sounds deeply unamused. Uh, well, of course. I mean, heck, this is the first time we met, and pretty sure he hasn't met a creature like this before. All the postings advertising Leander's bloodhounds. They are difficult to miss. When you meet Leander, tell him I sent you. That isn't much to go on, but Kuras points towards the clinic's back door. You will be safe, as long as you do not draw attention to yourself. That's easier said than done. I've always been a magnet for the worst sort of attention. If you require my assistance, you may return whenever you wish. So he's smiling, there's a note of finality in his voice. Resigned to my dismissal, I slip out the back door. I find myself standing in a narrow and rather gloomy alley. I pull the new cloak up over my nose, stepping over the contents of chamber pots that have been emptied into the street. Something weighs heavily inside one of the coat's pockets. My coin purse. Everything is still inside. Every last coin that I scraped together for the journey to Iridia. Does it even look like it was open? There were so few coins to begin with, they probably weren't worth stealing. I glance back at the clinic's closed door. Kuras didn't take any payment. He didn't even ask for a future favor. But he also said that in Iridia, secrets are power. Does he expect me to give up mine at some point? That's not exactly a comforting thought. Still, no matter why he did it, Kuros gave me a second chance and a lead on where I might find help. I'd better get going before he changes his mind. I squeeze out of the alley and into a crowded main street. The line outside out Kuros's clinic stretches down the road already. Two thin paddlers queue alongside weathered elders. If any place is in desperate need of a free clinic, it's this one. The cobblestones are treacherously rough under my feet, deep grooves worn between them by regular flooding and decades of hard use. I knew Iridia was a river city, but I didn't expect it to look so eroded. The buildings are tired and dilapidated, all crammed together in narrow streets. A child darts by, clutching something greasy wrapped in paper. The smell of fried food drifts over to me. My stomach gives a faint gurgle. This morning's catch, fried up, hot and fresh, not too many eyeballs today. That sounds disgusting, but I am starving, so I duck my head under the stall's grubby awning. A large fish leers up at me, its three bulging eyes still visible through the thick layer of crispy batter. The vendor gives me a gap-toothed grin. What's the cheapest thing you got? The vendor points at a metal basket with what looks like long strips of savory fried dough. 
fresh, long lads. Three copper apiece. Don't burn your mouth. I take the coins out, counting them gingerly. At this rate, I might not even be able to afford dinner. Reluctantly, I drop the payment on the counter and take my meal. All right. Two streets later, I pass under the wrought iron archway, adorned with dangling garlands of red and pink lilies. The buildings in this quarter are a dizzying riot of colors, painted walls, and tinted glass everywhere I look. Sheer red and pink curtains flutter in open doorways. Musical voices call out invitingly. Incense mingle with the pungent scent of flowers, barely covering the salt and musk of warm bodies. This must be Iridia's entertainment district. I'm polishing off my food and dusting the crumbs off from my hands when I spot a poster. It features the silhouette of a smiling man wearing a single dagger-like earring and the word Bloodhounds printed above his head, a motto, as above, so below, circles the artwork. If Leander is the leader of the Bloodhounds, then the face printed on the poster is likely his. It follows the line of identical posters around a corner. It nearly hit my head on a precariously dangling wooden sign. Look it up. Faded orange letters read, The Wet Wick. The facade of the building looks like it's seen better days, but I hear a faint music and laughter coming from inside. Well, in we go. This is a lovely little tavern. The inside of the bar is a far cry from the abandoned exterior. It's not even midday, yet most of the tables and booths are occupied by a loose assembly of people in matching green cloaks. There's a lot you can tell about a city by its dives. This one seems ordinary enough, even if the uniforms are unusual. A cursory glance doesn't turn up anyone with a dagger-shaped earring. I'm about to head towards the counter when a chant rises from the center of the room. Show! 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 The remaining green cloaks abandon the bar and their booths to rush towards the center of the room in a sun torrent. There's no time to move out of the way. I'm caught. Swept along in the ale stench current. <laughs> hey! Rhythmic chantings drown on my voice. I thrash, throwing out my elbow as the press of bodies grow heavier. My hips knock into a table. I grip it, holding on tightly to steady myself, but the crowd has stilled. The chanting stopped. A pair of gilded boots stride across the tabletop. Uh, seriously? You dogs? Again? Scattered laughter and cheers rise from the audience. I drag my eyes upwards. Too pretty! Too pretty! A well-dressed man stands on the table in front of me, his broad shoulders framed by the thick lapels of a trench coat. This really is the last time, alright? This time when he speaks, the audience falls silent as though bewitched by his magnetic presence or rich, low voice. But nothing is as captivating as his smile. He beams at a crowd around him, a performer on his makeshift stage. Don't blink, or you'll miss it. He laughs, and the dagger-shaped earring dangling on his left ear catches the light in a flash of gold. It would seem I found Leander. He raises his hand above the audience and snaps. A flash of green, pale light. Real magic, no ordinary stage trick, blinds me. Whoa. As the brilliance ebbs, my gaze refocuses on the mage towering above me. He flicks his wrists, and a magic spiraling around him coalesces. A delicate flower stem sprouts from his pinched fingers, one by one, growing lilies, petals, spring forth. With a flourish, the mage presents the conjured flowers. The audience bursts into clapping and cheers. A genuine magic show was the last thing I expected from a place called the Wet Wick. Leander plucks the iridescent bouquet out of the air and turns in a slow circle, giving his audience a good look. Now, now, who could use some good luck? Eager onlookers scoot closer to the table. Some reach for lilies, while others whistle and call Leander's name. But his cool green eyes slide right over them, looking onto me instead. How about you? My chest tightens. Every person gathered turned to stare at me. I will take the flowers? I reach out, all too aware of the way my fingers tremble as I carefully take the flowers from him. There's no way to them, only a faint warmth that radiates from the stems. As soon as the flowers leave Leander's hand, their light dims. They fade away in a shower of opalescent light. To my surprise, Leander laughs under his breath. That's the problem of flowers. 
They don't last long, but they leave an impression, right? He grins at me, and I find myself smiling back. He's too pretty, oh no. Leander steps off the table, dropping among the excited crowd with an audible clink. All right, bloodhounds, get back to your drinks. Show's over. The green cloaks disperse at his command, returning to their tables and booths. Before I can make my way towards Leander, his eyes find me. He gives me a friendly wave, then beckons me over to the crowded counter. I manage to squeeze myself beside him. There's so little room that his broad shoulders press against mine. I tense, but he doesn't seem to mind at all. This is your first time to Iridia. He says it lightly, with a genuine air of curiosity. Do I stick out that much? No, but I'm certain I'd remember seeing a face as lovely as yours around Lowtown. I, I, uh, I know that everyone here is pretty, but I, I didn't expect to be flirted on my very first encounter with Leander. Oh boy. <laughs> my eyes flicker to the polished countertop. I'm not used to flattery, and being this close makes eye contact difficult. As if on cue, the bartender approaches us. What can I get you? Surprise me and add anything my friend wants to my tab. I wasn't expecting the generosity, but I have to admit, I do feel a little thirsty after all that fried dough. Uh, I'll have what he's having. While the bartender leaves to fix our drinks, Leander leans his elbows to the counter. I'm close enough to notice the purple shadows under his lower lid. His eyes wander over me in return, but then they lock on my bandaged hands. The sour taste rises in my throat. Here comes the questions. So, what brings you to the wick? Kira sent me. He pushes his hair back from his forehead, but immediately falls right back into place. God, I feel your pain, Leander. <laughs> so it's about work. The bartender returns with a pair of glasses filled with what I can only assume is beer. I raise my glass and give it an experimental whiff. It smells faintly yeasty, but with an undercurrent I can't quite place. A quick sip confirms my worst suspicions. It's awful, somehow briny and sour in a way that reminds me of pickles. It's not bad. I'll keep up sipping. I mean, like, heck, it could be, like, very refreshing after everything I went through. Any thoughts of complaining dies the moment I look up and see Leander taking a deep swig from his glass. He lets out a satisfied breath. How can I be of assistance? I need to get to the Cenobium. As soon as the word Cenobium leaves my mouth, entire bar falls silent. But hounds twist around their seats to gawk openly. Finally, an especially drunk one speaks up. The hell are you bringing up the Cenobium in here? Throw him out! This is bloodhound territory! The vitriol catches me off guard from the angry looks thrown my way. It's clear I've broken some unspoken rule just by mentioning the Cenobium. When I glance at Leander, he's drinking as though he hasn't noticed the uproar. Only when he catches me looking does he lower his glass. For the love of... He drags a hand down his face. Hey, keep it down, will ya? This is business. I tense, expecting an argument, but the outspoken bloodhound silently returned to their drinks. Only a handful continued to watch me warily. Sorry about them. The Cenobium's a bit of a touchy subject in these parts. Mix in enough drinks and, well, you saw. How about we continue this outside? But I give him a tense nod, he pushes away from the bar counter. Well, where are we going? I follow Leander to an alleyway tucked behind the wet wick, where layers of frayed bloodhound posters have plastered the walls. Seeing them side by side, the resemblance between Leander and his likeness on the poster is impressive. Kuros didn't send you here for help with the Cenobium, did he? From the look he gives me, he already knows the answer. I glance away. No, he didn't. He suggested I find an alternative. Yet here you are, asking about them anyway. What do you need the Cenobium for? I don't want to tell him about my curse. The less people know about my capabilities, the better. Thankfully, Leander takes my reluctant silence as my answer. Well, I see you're already aware of the city's currency. Information's worth its weight in gold here. Kuros told you the truth. The Cenobium's dangerous. Get on the bad side and they'll imprison you if you're lucky. Or torture you if you're not. But the Cenobium is supposed to be a place of learning. A sanctuary. The Cenobium has always been heralded as the last bastion of human knowledge. A shining beacon of hope in a world steeped in nightmares. If any place held answers, it would be the Cenobium. 
That's why I came here. That's what they want you to think. The things that seem too good to be true are often just that. Such a simple statement, and yet it leaves me reeling. If it's true, if I staked everything on a lie, then what now? Leander clears his throat. But as I've always said, there's a solution to every problem, and alternatives to every solution. He claps his hands and turns to me with a brilliant smile. That's why Kuros pointed you to the Bloodhounds. Let us help you. Whether it's hunting soulless, finding people, or recovering stolen valuables, we can do it all, and free of charge. <laughs> ah, funny thing you say that, considering I am a thief. Oh boy, please don't tell me I have to like, like, butt heads against Leander someday. Oh boy. I'm shaking my head before he's even finished his practice speech. My patience is wearing dangerously thin. Listen, I appreciate the offer, but my problem can't be solved by a group of good Samaritans. To my chagrin, Leander nods slowly. Then your problem must be fairly serious, and if the Cenobium's your first choice, you're searching for a magical solution, aren't you? But my eyes widen, he nods along, as though he suspected all along. I'd be happy to help you out. That is, if you'll tell me what ails you. Leander might not work for the Cenobium, but he is a mage, and a powerful one at that if his demonstration earlier is any indication. I'm silent, played by indecision. I don't know if I can trust him, but it's not like I have any other alternatives. I hate to admit it, but this could be my only path forward. A confession comes out in a pained whisper. I'm cursed. Cursed? Oh, now I'm very curious. What kind of curse? Something ancestral or more recent? He looks me up and down, taking my face, my eyes, and finally my hands. It's your hands, isn't it? I wait until I'm certain my voice will remain steady before answering. My touch is dangerous. It changes people. Hurts them. Before I've even finished, Leander begins taking his glove off. He tucks his left hand free and flexes his fingers. Let's see it. He offers me his hand, and a prismatic flash of magic ripples across his palm, but I'm already shrinking backwards. I, I can't. I don't care how confident Leander is. I can't bring myself to hurt him, to see his face twist into a mask of madness. Believe me, this isn't an ordinary curse. It'll be fine. Perhaps where you came from, your affliction was strange and one of a kind. You'll spend a year in the city, and you'll see a thousand curses and thrice as many cures. Do you really think Kuras would send you here if I couldn't handle it? How should I know? I only met him today. I'm as good as any mage in Cenobium. Better even if they can help, so can I. You don't know what you're asking me. I'm asking you to trust me. I look from Leander's outstretched hands on his confident smile. Then, with a short breath, I begin unwinding the bandages from my hand. Fine. If you lose control, don't say I didn't warn you. You can tie me up first if it makes you feel better. It will make me feel infinitely better to tie you up. Oh my god. <laughs> With each joint I expose, I grow more and more certain that this is a terrible idea. Ready when you are. If he's bothered by the way my hand looks, he doesn't show it. My fingers hover shakily over his palm. Three, two, one. Uh, I touch him? I tap his palm once, as quickly as possible. It's barely more than a brush, but that's all it ever takes. If I look at his face, expect you to see the worst. Leander only grins. See? It can't be. This time, when I reach out to touch Leander's palm again, he catches my wrist before I can pull away. I told you, there's nothing to worry about. He trails off when my thumb brushes the soft skin of his inner wrist. We're holding hands! <laughs> I search for Leander's face for traces of madness, but his eyes remain a clear, soft green. Color rises in his cheeks, but it remains still except for the subtle bobbing of his throat. Uh, it, he's so cute when his blushes. Oh god, oh god. Neither of us speaks as I trace the contours of Leander's palm, lost in an awareness I wasn't prepared for. I've been with other people, kissed them, been embraced by them, and more, but not like this. My fingers, long deprived by years of bandaging, picked up every single detail. The grooves of his palm, the smooth shell of his nails, the pulse of his heart. For as long as I've lived, 
I've never been able to hold someone's hand, not without dire consequences. I never realized what I was missing until this moment. While Leander's pulse is steady, Ben is hammering as fear gives way to excitement. I will keep touching him. <laughs> Sorry for how cursed that is, but I'm going to keep touching him. My hand glides over to Leander's wrist and up his forearm, where smooth skin abruptly gives way to a raised scar by the edge of his sleeve. It matches the one that runs from his collar to cheekbone. Could it be the same wound? I glance at Leander's face and his lips part as he considers his words before speaking. Am I the first person you'd be able to touch like this? My hand goes still on his arm. So far. I'll admit, your touch does make it somewhat difficult to stay level-headed, but not due to your power. He takes my hand, his soft green eyes flick to mine before it turns to inspect the golden fissures crisscrossing my knuckles. Look, we match. He points at a golden pin on his coat collar and I give him a small smile. I draw my hand back and take a steadying breath. My head feels as though it's stuffed with cotton. Habit alone guides me through the motions of rewrapping my hand, although my fingers tremble too much for the bandages to lie flat. I can't believe that worked. May I ask your name? I'm Lion, and I touched you before we even knew each other by name. You're right to hide it from me, Lion. That curse of yours is unlike anything I've ever dealt with. You can tell you're discreet, but... You'd best not go showing that off to anyone else. I didn't plan on it. You're staying in Lowtown. I pause. Room and board was something I hadn't even considered. I don't even know. Let's get you probably settled then. He's even getting me a room? The wet wick is noticeably quieter. Without their leader, most of the bloodhounds have dispersed, or in a few cases, fallen asleep beside their drinks. Got any rooms left, or did my lot grab them all to sleep it off? The bartender, who I now realize doubles as an innkeeper, slides a key onto the counter. You know I always keep a corner room open for your escapades. Are you telling me that Leander often brings guests over to his inn? Nice. Leander's laugh sounds slightly strained, and I always appreciate it. But you're mistaken. This is just for my friend, Lion. Sure, sure. Stay as long as you like. You two have fun. Escapades, huh? Leander clears his throat, then holds the key out to me. But I hesitate. My coin purse barely holds enough for a day's worth of meals, let alone in room. How much do I owe you? Nothing. Bloodhound rates. My treat. Since you shared your secret. Food, drink, warm bed, anything you need. Carefully, I take the key from him. It's small, but weighs heavy in my palm. Never expected to have a warm bed in Iridia, let alone free meals. I plan to steal whatever I needed to get by, no matter how dangerous. Thank you. Go explore, Lion. You'll find many roads in Iridia, each leading to different answers, but if you need a reprieve from what haunts you, come find me. Just be careful. I nod, taking one last look at the gleaming bronze key before tucking into the pocket of my coat for safekeeping. Leander gives me one last friendly wave before I depart. Wow, I get my own room. Lovely. The air clings, sun and heavy. Without the morning crowd, the sunless streets look barren and bleak. Even the paddlers are long gone. Only a pair of crows remains quibbling over a stale crust in the gutter. I feel a ridiculous pang of envy. At least they've got a reason to fight. I've never felt so lost. Kuras and Leander both made it clear that Cenobium can't be trusted. I came so far, endeared so much. I need to see the Cenobium for myself, if only to sate my curiosity. I should have asked someone at the bar for directions before leaving. What? I'm about to turn back when a shadow passes over me. A cloud, I think. Until a puff of hot breath tickles the back of my neck. Ayo! Hey, the shadow runs down the streets in rivulets. Formless dark spreads like ink into blotted shapes. Claws stretch. A muzzle splits open to reveal long, jagged teeth. A growl rumbles so low and deep, I feel it. I want to run, to scream, but I feel trapped, as though the slightest movement or a single breath will snap the jaws around me shut. No, I won't let it end like this. If I'm going to die, I want to see what got me first. I steal myself, then turn.
The shadow vanishes as quickly as it came. I'm left standing in the middle of the street, alone, except for a figure reclining in the shade of a nearby stoop. Ayo? Oh my god! Oh! Oh my god! Ah! Uh, ah! Uh, a monster! The much is clear from a glance. One that could nearly be mistaken for a human were it, were it not for the tufted ears, the tail curled around his ankle, or the dust pink eyes with pupils that sharpen like needles when they fall on me. Our eyes meet and the monster uncrosses his long legs. His hair gleams a shade of red that reminds me unsettlingly of blood where it curls along his colored throat. Jumpy, aren't you? His tone is so light and carefree that I glance over my shoulder to make sure he's speaking to me. I look back, the stranger props his chain on his knuckles and regards me with an inscrutable little smile. Didn't you see that shadow just now? It was massive, moved like a beast. Even as I speak, I'm aware of how ridiculous it must sound, but the stranger's smile doesn't falter. The only beasts I've seen are the wicks drooling regulars, so this did catch my eye. Hey, yo, that's my key! Are you saying you want to come into my room with me? Because I won't mind it. I mean, I, I won't mind having you as my pets. Oh my god. With a flourish of his hand, my in-room key appears dangling from his finger. It turns on its chain, glittering when it catches the light. My hand flies to my coat pockets and sure enough, find them flat. He crooks his finger, beckoning. I've already taken two steps forwards before some stifled instinct stops me. Something feels wrong. I'm still on the edge, thrumming with so much adrenaline that the stranger's shadow flickers at the edge of my vision. I always attract the worst kind of attention, but I can't get rattled now. Who said that's my key? Where did you find it? Oh god, I know that if I say who said that's my key, like, it's likely he's probably gonna keep it. So where did you find it? How'd you even find it? The key, I mean. What can I say? I'm a sucker for shiny things. He smiles wide enough to reveal pointed canines. I saw you drop it. You really should be more careful. City like this, somebody might take advantage. Hey, you! <laughs> a bald-faced lie said without a hint of irony. There's no way I dropped that key, but I can't think of an explanation for how it went from my pocket into his hand. I approach the man, careful to keep an arm's length away. It doesn't look dangerous, but the most deadly ones never do. The stranger's chain softly clinks with the tilt of his head, his ears flick. Keeping your distance? Until I figure out how you managed to rob me? Yeah, I am. You think I stole your dinky little key from all the way over here? He gives an exaggerated sigh. Oh, I'm good for my hands, but not that good. Do really look like a common thief to you. Ow! 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 He's got me there. The sheer fabric of his sleeves alone would be too expensive for most street thieves. Hell, his shoes look like they cost more than I spent traveling here. And then there's the shop behind him. No matter the city, parted pink curtains only ever mean one thing. I'm not looking to buy, and I doubt I could ever afford your services anyway. Oh. Luckily for you, I don't charge. Uh, hey, yo! <laughs> the man runs the tip of his tongues over a fang, and for the first time since I stepped into that shadow, I feel something other than dread. My face grows hot. That's not what I meant! I'm flattered, really. Where'd that be my trade? I might make an exception for you. Hmm, how about half off for a handy? Or you could just hand over my key! Ask nicely, and might even let you tuck my tail. Just throw it here! Throw it that! So some spindly little street urchin can snatch it and run. He raises my key and tilts his head so he can watch it dangle back and forth. I suppose I could just claim a room for myself. Not that I'll be caught dead slumming in the wick with the rest of those slack-jawed imbeciles. You're obviously not from around here, so tell me, Traveler. What misfortune brought you to this wretched place? His voice practically drips with derision. I'm not telling you anything. Uh, what could have possibly drawn you to this 
dreary little pig pen, I wonder. He listlessly watches the Archimite key swinging around his finger. The weather's poo, the food's dreck, and there's entirely too many monsters for a human to feel safe. Unless... Dagger's sharp eyes flick towards me. They gleam with amusement. Unless you're just dying to consort with monsters. You, uh... You might got me there. I mean, <laughs> I... Oh, God, stop calling me out. I don't even know your name yet. By now, my embarrassment has worn away, leaving simmering impatience in its place. If this is a shakedown, it's the most frustrating one I've ever experienced. Uh, I will flirt back. How'd you know that I spent all my money, starved and nearly died in a swamp just so I could crawl into bed with the first thirsty monster I saw? That earns me a burst of breathy laughter. He gazes at me under his dark lashes. Aren't you funny? Could you be any more obvious? I've been told subtlety is not my strength. So, your place or mine? I'd invite you if I had my key. If I only had my key, I might be able to invite you up. His languid gaze glides from me to my key in his hand and back. Come. Take my hand and we'll go together. The more he flirts, the more convinced I become that this is some kind of trap. No matter how innocent monsters look, they always have tricks up their sleeves. And something tells me that this one's more dangerous than he lets on, even if he has a lovely laugh. I don't know what you want or why you're messing with me, but I'm not coming any closer until I know you're not going to attack or bite. I won't bite hard unless you beg me. No matter what I say, he finds a way to twist my words into an innuendo. I like him. Can you please give me your name? Even when I'm silent, it goes on as though we're having a conversation, not a standoff. If you like dancing, there's a traveling troupe performing in Hightown tonight. Their lutus is utterly exquisite, truly a performance to die for. There's life in this dreadful place, if you know where to look. You sound like you know the city well. The man's gaze flickers from me to the key dangling from his finger. Naturally, this dump was little more than a miserable little smear when I first arrived. High town, low town, I know Iridia like the back of my hand. What about the Cenobium? You know where it is? His smile vanishes. Surely you've seen it. That absurdly large tower looming over the rest is a little hard to miss. It must have meant the spire I noticed when I first caught sight of Iridia. That's... The Cenobium's overrated. Forget about it. I could show you things those stuffy boars in their limp, penis tower couldn't even dream of. I've already got plans. Oh, have you some pressing matters at the Cenobium? Lunch dates with librarians? Tea time with the most esteemed abbess? That's my business. What's it matter to you? I square my shoulders and the amusement bleeds out of him. Your loss. The stranger, finally bored of his tedious game, extends his hand towards me. The key rests on his palm, neatly dividing skin and leather. When he makes no other move, I reach for the key, but as soon as my fingers graze smooth brass, his hand springs shut around my elbow. Hey, yo! Hey! Hey? He yanks me down, I stagger, my soul slipping under the steps. Well, eager, aren't you, stranger? For a sick moment, I fear my bandages will unravel under his touch, but he's careful not to disturb them, even as his fingers dig into my arm. I knew I smelled blood. You reek of death and the road. And that freaking doctor. His voice, one silken, lowers into a smoky growl. The shadows around him seethe and boil as he pulls me closer. And something else. He murmurs against my throat, nose grazing my jaw. L let go! I try to twist away, but it doesn't budge. His breath trills down my neck, sending a thrill of dread through me. But just when I fear he'll bite, he takes a deep whiff instead. His wide, flat eyes gleam with naked hunger as he gazes up to me. Not quite human. Not quite monster. Seems we're both. There! The stranger's ears flatten, and he releases me with short breath. I get my arm back, massaging it where his grip left grooves in my bandages. The stranger twists around to watch a woman duck out from under the curtains behind him. 
Her pressed uniform bears the insignia of the Cenobium. I leave you for all what? Ten minutes and you're making trouble again? Will you quit harassing the tourists? The stranger, there I take it, rolls his eyes and flashes the cleric a withering smile. So suspicious. Can't you see this is a friend of mine? A natural liar. He grins at me and his tail swishes minutely. The woman purses her lips at me, clearly unconvinced. I open my mouth to correct him, but Vera cuts in. I was graciously offering my dear friend some free advice. Though his voice remains bright and cheerful, his expression darkens. The angel's drawn to you like a moth to a flame. It will always find you. Given time, the woman clucks her tongue, as though she's heard this recital 102 times. Word of advice? Don't seek free advice from lazy foxes lounging in the streets. This crook would sell water to a drowning man for the sheer enjoyment of it. She shrugs off a wilting look from Vare. Oh, please. Any friend of yours knows it's true. Now hold still. Vare rises gracefully at her approach. He pushes his hair aside so it drapes over one shoulder, exposing the long line of his neck. And suddenly, it dawns on me that the jingly I heard earlier wasn't coming from the harness attached to his collar, but a leash. A heavy iron chain wound around a hitching post and padlock to the back of his collar. Vera posed deliberately to hide his leash from me. The woman produces a key rig from a pocket. She rifles through a dozen identical keys before selecting one and slotting it into the lock. Come on, unless you had friends tag along on our merry little soulless hunt. They're hunting for soulless inside the city? Words momentarily fail me. Uh... The woman regards me with a polite, if tight smile before marching down the stairs. There lingers. He stretches his arms over his head with a yawn. I try not to stare at the way his stomach flattens when he arches his back. Your little secret's safe with me. Try not to get yourself killed, hmm? Vera hops off the stoop and bounds after the woman. His tail sways merrily as though he hasn't just lied and threatened me. Did you try that thing I mentioned? The... Leventian not. The one where you take three fingers and act. Actually, don't tell me. Knowing you, it's disgusting. Bear's airy laughter echoes down the street. It's only after he and the cleric have vanished from sight I realize that I'm still missing something. Wait! Reflexively, I shove my hands into my pocket and find it. The room key. I ease the key from my pocket and smooth my thumb over its teeth as I try to recall a touch, a tell, or any hint of Bear's sleight of hand. I can't figure out how he did it. All I know for certain is that the Cenobium saw fit to leash him, a fate I could share, if that's what his vague warning meant. I let my eyes drift skywards, past the lanterns gently swing in the breeze to the Cenobium faintly visible through the haze. Just one glimpse is all I need, then I can put it all behind me. This time, the key goes into my coin purse for safekeeping. It's easy enough to follow the sluggish river that splits Iridia in two. A colossal bridge arches over the dark waters below. I cross as quickly as I can, climbing over every uphill towards the distant tower. Hours later, legs aching, sweat beating on my forehead, I finally find what I was searching for. The Cenobium of the Luminous Void. It stands at the highest point of Iridia, surrounded by cold, white walls, well-dressed people stroll down the walkways, paying no attention to the massive tower in the midst. I'm the only one standing before the gates. I crane my neck up and up until the top of the Cenobium Tower disappears into the clouds overhead. I frown up at the gates, wondering what horrible traps they might contain. Despite their delicate beauty, there must be more to them than meets the eye. Knocking seems like a terrible idea. I don't see any other way of making my presence known. I'm halfway up the stairs when something moves in my peripheral vision. A shadowy figure crouches beneath one of the white wells. They reach out and tug on a vine, as if testing its strength. Oi! You there! The shadow vanishes as quickly as I spotted it, and a god-faced man in a crisp charcoal uniform marches up the steps towards me. Ugh! Another tourist! Get out of here once you're done gawking! A dismissive wave accompanies his equally dismissive words, and he turns on his heel without even waiting for an answer from me. I look back to where I saw the intruder, but there's nothing, just the leaves blowing gently in a cool breeze. Well, anything else to say about this place? 
I step away from the gates, hopelessness washing over me. Hello. A whisper, so close I can feel the warm brush of breath on my skin. I instinctively jerk away, but there's no one beside me. Halfway down the staircase, I spot a woman swinging in the breeze. She's gaunt as a rail, a blouse, moth-eaten. I'm unable to take my eyes off her. Not because of the way she smiles a little too widely, or the way her tussled braids look unbrushed for days, but because her eyes shine with vibrant, unnatural crimson. I'm both entranced and unsettled by their subtle glow. These days, you need a miracle to get in there. I'm unsure of how to respond, or if I even should. Um, I say nothing. I'm not gonna be mean. After the experience I've just had, I'm not too keen in indulging strangers with small talk. Despite my silence, she maintains her unflinching stare and smile. Lucky for you, I have miracles for free. Whatever she's selling, I'm not interested. My words come out in a tired breath. No thanks. I start down the stairs, but she abruptly steps into my path. She turns her back to me, and before I can react, she slips her fingers under the lacing of her collar. Stripping out of her blouse in broad daylight? Ayo! What are you doing? As warm fabric unveils bare skin, my panic is smothered by cold horror. A mishap, sunken scar carves into the woman's body. Pitted, gnarled skin snakes down her shoulders, blooming from a gaping hole in the back of her neck. A shuddering breath escapes me. The frick? Whatever disease this woman had ate away from her, inside out. How is she able to move? Breathe? It's impossible. She shouldn't be alive, and yet... The power to cure anything can be yours, too. The power of the sea spring. The woman slides back into her blouse and deftly laces it up. If I've caught your interest, then follow me. It's only a short walk away. Without another glance, she leisurely strolls down the Cenobium stairs, loose braids bobbing behind her. The edge of her scars peek out from under her collar. I stand there, wordless, until I manage to gain my bearings. It's a twisted miracle, but a miracle nonetheless. This could be the stupidest decision in my life, but what choice do I have? I take a final look at the Cenobium's shut gates, and then follow her down the steps. We descend from the higher streets, leaving behind their gilded decadence as we cross the river. The wet, derelict streets feel more familiar to me. The crimson-eyed woman takes me further, then further still, until I'm met with an all-too-familiar sight. My gut lurches when I face the open horizon. The city's outskirts are hardly recognizable in daylight, probably safer for it, but venturing beyond Iridius walls is a gamble I wasn't prepared to take so soon. Keep going straight, and the sea spring will reveal itself to you. I bark out a bitter laugh, loud and involuntary. Oh god, I'd rather not. Are you kidding? It's not safe out there. You're as safe inside the city as outside of it. Truthfully, the territory before you is the safest of all. What do you mean, territory? This region belongs to Aes. Most people know him as a gang leader, but he's much more than that. I squint against the empty wastelands. Only a fool or someone with nothing to lose would leave the city. Apparently a both. If the sea spring cured her, I need to see what it can do for me. I set off into the waste. Over my shoulder, the woman calls after me. Good luck, lion. I hope we meet again. How does she have my name? My heart pounds with each step I take from civilization. For what seems like an eternity, I force each foot forward, one step, then another, until realization hits me. I never told the woman my name. Something pierces the horizon ahead of me. A building, nestled into a tall cliffside, but so starkly out of place, it might as well be a hallucination. It drips with extravagance and honey mahogany, an ornate jewel of architecture. A row of dark silhouettes stand out in the horizon, trees I think, until I'm close enough to realize what I mistook for branches were spikes and jutting tendrils. Soulless, several of them watch me in the distance like statues. I don't think, I just run, exploding into messy sprint. I push my legs as fast as they'll take me towards that decorated building. Flashes of last night chase me, the gushes of blood and screams of death, the smell of burning flesh and sour bile. I can't go through that again. I won't. The next thing I know, I'm dashing up wooden stairs and crashing through towering double doors. 
I gasp for air, my lungs burning from exertion. I'm desperate to be safe, but when I process my surroundings... It's more hellscape than sanctuary. Blood flows all around me, overwhelming my vision, with a lurid, unholy red. Instinctively, my hand leaps to my mouth, but the rotten stench of blood never comes. Instead, a smoky scent hangs in the air, sharp and spiced. I swallow thickly, convincing myself that it's not as gruesome as it appears. This has to be the sea spring, the place that grants miracles. Pulling my eyes away from the pool, I think in the rest of my environment. Tall pillars flank me, blanketed in written notes. Seating pillow scatters the floor. A rustic kettle sits nearby. Someone must live here, despite how eerily empty it is. I'll call out. Hello? Is anyone here? A voice echoes throughout the cavern without response. I approach the paper-covered pillars. Maybe something here can tell me what to reach for. Ah, uh, topmost? Reach for a note that's higher up. It reads, No one will read this. It's not for anyone else. This is evidence I existed in this rotten, grim world. Even so, wish I could have stayed longer. The bar girl will be lonely without me. I should tell her how I... The rest is scratched out. I wonder who wrote this. Before I can ponder it any further, a sharp chill runs down my spine. Something's watching me. Hi? I quickly set the note back. Eyes darting around the wooden deck. It's still empty. Vacant. Finally, I look towards the sea spring. That stillness hides something deeper. Something wrong. Hey. I spin around and come face to face with a pack of soulless. They chitter and growl. Tendrils and spikes flaring threateningly. All different sizes and species. They're sharing one identical trait. Glowing crimson eyes. I try to back away, but my heel teeters over the sea spring. I'm cornered. Watch your step. It's deeper than it looks. The voice again. The sound of it, the soulless breeze, the snarls quieting. Who's it gonna be? I search for the voice's source, find it above me, lounging in the rafters. Ah, uh, 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 hi, hi, I'm guessing your eyes. You look lost, little sparrow. His gaze is a violent crimson, one that sears through me, leaving me feeling raw and exposed. They're the same eyes I've seen over and over. First with a scarred woman, now with the soul circling me, all bound by the sea spring's blood red. In the shroud of darkness behind him, shapes like massive tentacles twist and coil around the wooden beams. I can't focus. The soulless growls ring in my ears. They're not advancing, but that could change at any second. Panic rises in my throat as I struggle to track them. Hey! Eyes on me. My stomach rolls as I tear my eyes away from the soulless. Don't ignore someone who's talking to you. It's not polite. For a moment, anger knocks my fear aside. Who is this dude? Uh, I'm distracted. I'm kind of distracted by the soulless about to maul me. Only by my command. I scan the soulless again. They really aren't attacking, boistering more than anything else. You tamed them? Power of the sea spring. They're hungry, so they might bite. You could give me a reason to stop them. How about I didn't do anything wrong? Trespassing. Is this punishable by death? He gives a non-committal shrug. I called out early to see if anyone was here. Were we supposed to play hide and seek? Hmm, didn't hear you. A voice stops in my throat. This man's terse coolness is both infuriating and terrifying. I rack my brain to find a way to defuse the situation. I need help. Okay, fine, I need help. I thought the sea spring could cure me somehow. My voice wavers pathetically. Honesty has never been my strong suit. He counts his head towards the side, praising me, but doesn't respond. I fidget nervously. I'm telling you, I came here for help. You're listening. Your hands. Alarm jolts through me. I hide my hands under my cloak. Show me. Why? Won't ask twice. With a sharp huff, I reluctantly hold out my bandaged hands. Are you getting off on this? Unwrap them. Oh, he's definitely getting off on this. Heat rushes to my face and fire to my tongue. I should give him a piece of my mind, but not when the, his soulless are one command from ripping me to shreds. Yet no matter how much I will myself to move, my body is frozen in place. I stand there for a long, agonizing minute. 
My hands are trembling when I finally raise them. I know the skin beneath the wrapping all too well. The hideous, unnatural flesh I've grown to despise. I grip the edges of the bandages. Stop. With a weary sigh, the man slides off the beam and lands with a thud that shakes the panels underfoot. He's a monster, with an imposing figure that towers over me. I couldn't tell how tall he was before, but he's big, illuminated by lantern light. His features are stronger, sharper. He's tall. Subtle clings of metal accompany each of his footsteps. The closer he gets to me, the faster my heart hitches. What does he want? Is he going to kill me? I step backwards and find nothing to set my foot on. I've forgotten my back was to the sea spring. I fall right before a warm hand catches my lower back. I'm hovering above the sea spring, the scent of smoke and leather enveloping me. Blazing crimson eyes pour into mine. Told you to watch your step. I'm too stunned to muster a response. Like I weigh nothing, he guides me back to solid ground and steps back. Following a subtle gesture from his fingers, the soulless around us disperse and relax. The shift in their demeanor is so abrupt, it gives me whiplash. The enormous tentacles are no longer in the rafters, so now I doubt I ever saw them at all. At the way, I exhale a breath of relief. Thanks. As focused on me as he was before, the monster pays no attention to me now. He kicks some seating pillow out of the walkways, checks the contents of the kettle with a skull. The sun disregard is almost insulting. So that's it. Not a threat anymore? Never were one. And why'd you threaten me? People get honest when they're afraid. In other words, he was messing with me. I drag a hand over my face, exhausted by the fact that this is the second time a monster has provoked me today. And they're both hot! Your eyes, aren't you? Depends who's asking. One of your friends told me this was your territory. She also said you were a gang leader. But there's no one else here. I thought there'd be more people. Ice picks up the cattle and walks to the edge of a sea spring, then dumps out the contents into the endless red. Gang took a walk. His pleasant smile stretches across his face, ear to ear. Then, in an instant, it drops. It gets a sense I shouldn't be asking about his gang again. Something must have happened. I've learned to recognize a real leader when I see one. Ice, regrettably, fits the type perfectly. He knows how to scare people, and he expects submission. But it's uncommon for someone so used to being in power to be so alone. You said you came here for help. Depends. Can the sea spring cure a disease? A curse, I mean. Probably. You mean you don't know? Nope. He shakes out the empty kettle and starts collecting stray cups, tidying up. My frustration builds. I narrow my eyes at him in a questioning glare. When he notices, he returns it with an amused smirk. Are you being irritating on purpose? Listen, Sparrow. The sea spring can cure anything. Nothing stopping you from trying it yourself. What do I have to do? Drink. I have to drink from the sea spring? Also, how did that other woman drink from the sea spring? I'm pretty sure it all come like gushing out of her neck hole. My eyes glide to the blood-like pool beside us. The idea of ingesting the strange liquid makes my guts churn. Is there a price? Always. Ice taps his temple with a finger. You lose it a little bit. That's it? I'd have already beat it to a punch. I mean, heck, this is your first time meeting me, but I am just completely unhinged, Ice. Like, my hinges have been firmly unscrewed off my head long ago. My humor earns me an amused, fanged grin. Hmm, this is a little different. When you drink from the sea spring, you forget who you are. Your mind combines with everyone who ever drank before. Humans, monsters, soulless. One big happy family in your head. My blood runs cold. I've heard of these before. Group minds. I thought they were just rumors. I heard whispers of cults performing rituals to bind their members' minds together. It never seemed possible. Something tells me this is real. Even if one thing doesn't add up. Your eyes are red too. But you obviously haven't forgotten who you are. Before I can finish my sentence, ice strides past me towards the entrance. Time's up. Let's finish this later. Wait, already? You barely told me anything! Came on a bad day. Good somewhere to be. There's still so many questions burning at the tip of my tongue, but my frustration spills out before any of them. 
I was told to come here for help, but instead I got threatened and kicked out. You're joking, right? Watch your tone. I'm nice, but you don't want to ruin the host's mood. My skin prickles. The feeling of being watched washes over me again. My eyes dart back over to the sea spring. A lone ripple dances on the quiet surface. I take Isis' advice and clamp my mouth shut. Isis approaches a nearby solace, a lanky dog-like one with six legs and a crown of tendrils. Several set of crimson eyes adorn its sides. Its forked tail wags rapidly when I squats beside it. He runs his fingers through the tendrils, scratches its chin, and pats its head. A gentle smile plays across Isis' lips. The affection he holds for the solace is painfully clear. I dip my eyes away, his stomach fluttering at the tender sight. It's getting dark out, so this pretty girl will guide you back. Following a short whistle from Isis' lips, it trots over the entrance obediently, tail swaying. I watch the solace warily. Pretty is not a word I'd use to describe it, and the idea of it protecting me sounds absurd. I would decide to drink. How should I find you? Find someone with eyes like mine. They'll point you in the right direction. But think it over. Once you drink, you can't go back. It's a lot to process, but I give a small nod. At least I know I have another option for a cure, as disturbing as it may be. I follow his solace at a measured distance, watching it nudge the giant doors open with ease, and I'm about to cross its threshold. I sneak one last glance behind me. My heart skips when I meet Isis' eyes. I'm about to snap my head away, but he just flashes me an easy smile. Till next time, Sparrow. I'll buy you a drink for scaring you. I don't trust myself to do anything but respond with another curt nod. Well... Outside, more crimson-eyed solace scuttle about. It's hard to believe it's the same threatening pack from before. They chase each other in circles, roll around in the bog's mud. They pay no attention to me as the dog-like one escorts me away. It's an uneventful trip. Sometimes the solace looks over its shoulders at me to make sure I'm still following. Ooh, a lovely night. Dust darkens the sky by the time we reach the city. The solace sits and looks at me expectantly with familiar crimson eyes. I will pet the solace? As nervous as I am, I carefully glide my finger through the solace's tendrils and scratch beneath its chin, just like eyes had. It pushes into my palm in response, rumbling with a sound akin to a purr, the vibrations are soothing, almost healing my fatigue. When it's satisfied, the solace spins around and scampers back in the direction we came, vanishing into the darkness. It's barely my first day in Iridia, and I've already encountered so many things I thought were impossible, tamed solace being one of them. My head spins. Maybe I should call it a day. Well, back in the tavern, I guess. Nightfall creeps across the streets of Iridia. The city, a labyrinth even in daytime, has become a warren of treacherous alleyways. The streets are completely deserted. If I hadn't been here earlier, I would have thought this part of the city was abandoned. I make my way through the winding streets, doing my best to keep my bearings towards the wet wick. I step slow when I hear rustling in the dark. I strain my ears, but everything is still. It's the silence playing tricks on me. Something is wrong. Fine hairs at the back of my neck prickles, a frizzing of discomfort running down my spine. Something is wrong. My eyes dart from one side of the street to another, searching for movement, but the shadows are as deep and dark as pools of ink, and I see nothing. I can't stay here. I need to reach a busy part of the city. Drawing my cloak tighter around my body, I hurry on my way. Though I keep my eyes sharp and listen intently, there's only the sound of my own footsteps. As the moments pass and nothing happens, I begin to wonder. Maybe I really did imagine the noise. I turn the next corner and my thoughts come screaming to a halt. My head spins, the world blurring as adrenaline rushes through my veins. Only one thing is clear amidst the haze. The soul is that attacked the caravan. It's crouched over a dark, indistinct shape, a body. A garland of intestines spill from pallet flesh. Blood grouts the cobblestones. For a mercy, the solace is too distracted by its meal to have noticed me. My feet feel as heavy as stone. I can't stand there. Holding my breath, I take a step backwards, but the wet slurping sounds don't abate. I take another, then another. Then a shard of glass crunches under my heel. 
The world seems to slow to a crawl as the solace raises its head, blood dripping from its tendrils, every single one of its bulging eyes fixed unblinkingly on me. It's really here. It's come back for me. Yeah, I'm running. I'm off like a shot, running for my life through the darkened streets. Behind me, a piercing bass blitz the silence, and heavy footfall pounds after me. My heart thunders in my chest. I take turns at random, trying to lose it in the maze of the streets, but I can't seem to shake it. I can hear its breathing now, a wet, fluttering rasp, growing closer and closer. The same claws that sever my arms swipes out. I duck, saved by pure reflex, and skid around the corner. I take three running strides before the bottom drops out of my stomach. A wall twice as high as me bars my way. A dead end. When I turn around, Solus looms in the entry to the alleyway. It's no longer running. It doesn't have to. As it prowls closer, my thoughts race. Some of the buildings lined the streets are lit. There must be people inside. It's a long shot, but... Uh... Uh... Try the nearest door! This is a terrible idea! I roll, grabbing at the handle of the closest door. It turns completely, and the hinge is creaking as I push. I feel a flash of hope before a weight hits the door from the other side, and it slams shut. The click of the lock turning is grimly final. In this wretched world, few people will stick their neck out to help their own flesh and blood. Never mind a stranger. The Solus gives a rasping hiss. It's the only warning I get before it lunges for me with a flash of claws. I hurl myself to the side, but the slick cobblestones betray me. I fall, sprawling over the rough stone. As the solace looms over me, I scramble away from it until my back hits the wall. There's nowhere left to go. It descends on me for the kill. But the impact never comes. Again? Wait, what? I rarely crack one eye open, then the other. Not sure whether I should believe what I'm seeing. A hooded figure crouches in front of me. One bloodstained hand outstretched. Moonlight silvers the edge of their stiletto knife. Their face and hands are splattered with blood and soulless. My eyes dart past the unexpected rescuer to the misshapen form behind them. The soulless many eyes, once restless and vibrant, now look dull and waxy. A red pool spreads slowly from under its body. Numb with shock, I can't help but stare. It's dead. After all the people it's killed, after nearly killing me twice, I can hardly believe it. Well? I gingerly take the offered hand. The stranger's gaze dips to my bandages, pale lips part, on the brink of a question, then close again. With a strength belying their slight frame, they pull me to my feet. As soon as I'm on my own two feet again, they pull away from me and start wiping the blood from their face and their hands. Stay there. They turn away from me stiffly leaning over the Solus's gangly body. With the back towards me, I realized that I saw their hooded silhouettes at the Cenobium. You saved me. I shouldn't have had to. The harsh response takes me back. Before I can formulate a response, they continue. What are you thinking? Traveling alone at night? This is far from the worst thing haunting Lowtown. I can't make heads of tales of them. First they saved me, and now they scold me? Lesson learned. I could do without the lecture, though. To my surprise, they break eye contact. Their attention glides towards the Solus's corpse. They examine it with inscrutable expression. I clear my throat to fill the silence. I'm lying. Min. Suddenly, Min tenses. Their blade flashes as they drive it into the back of the Solus's neck. The Solus thrashes once, letting out a rattling hiss as the air leaves its lungs. Min leads on the blade driving it deeper and deeper until there's a sickening crunch and the creature goes limp. My heart thuds in my chest. It must have been clinging to life by a thread. Min strains up, withdrawing their blade in a single smooth motion. It hurts to put wretched things like this out of their misery. They calmly clean the blood from their knife. That swift, unhesitating, lethal strike wasn't the work of an amateur. But they don't act like any of the cold-blooded killers I've seen in the past. Why is the soulless inside the city? Min looks at me, eyes searching before realization dawns. You're new here. There's no walls around the city. Soulless can come and go as they please, until someone is contracted to stop them. The Cenobium's patrols don't bother to protect Lowtown. Not anymore. Let me guess. You're not a fan of Cenobium? I wouldn't go that far. Their brow abruptly furrows, and they sheath their knife, motioning me to follow them. It's not safe here. 
The vultures can smell death. I'm not quite sure what they mean, but I don't want to stay lost in the city. I trail behind them as they stride down the street. Also, I do not want to know anything about the vultures. It was so dangerous. Why are you helping me? I came for the bounty on that Solus. You were in the way. Not killing you isn't the same as helping you. Don't count on being so lucky again, or you'll be dead by sunrise. The answer is stingingly harsh. <sighs> I just need to find my lodgings. I hold my hands up, trying to forestall any more snippy comments. Alright, I get it. I'd love to get out of your way, but I'm sort of lost. I need to get the directions back to my lodgings. What makes you think I'll help you? Nothing, but there's no harm in asking. It seems to catch them off guard. Their brow knits, and they look away, scowling. How troublesome. Lion? <gasps> hey! It's Kuros! Oh, my boy! I turn, surprised by the voice. Kuros walks down the street towards us. His white and gold clothing is pristine, despite the grime of the city. Hello, Min. I see the Solus was your work. Min shrugs. There's a familiarity in the way they regard each other. Um, you know them, Kuras? Min is a freelancer who has done a few errands for me. They are quite reliable. Unreliable freelancers don't eat. There's something Kuras isn't saying here. Lion needs to get back to wherever Sarah is staying before they wander to the jaws of another solace. It is late. Were you able to find a place to stay, Lion? I'm staying at the Wet Wick. Both their faces fall. I see. Would you like a guide? Might be preferable to wandering around alleyways. That would be nice. Min clicks their tongue and sighs, sounding mightily put out. Going to Amaryllis District. That gaudy cesspit? Come, this way. Despite Min's clear distaste, when Kuros leads me down the street, they keep pace with us. Catching my curious gaze, Min's eyes narrow. It's not safe this late. I don't care about you, but Kuras is the only doctor worth a damn in this place. You like this with everyone. The deadpan look Min gives me is answer enough. I catch Kuras hiding a slight smile. I suppress a sigh and resign myself to having a grumpy shadow all the way back to the wet wick. The route Kuras takes is completely different from my slow meandering earlier this morning. In no time at all, he cuts through darkened streets and twisting alleys. Hey, we made it! It seems like half the city has poured into the Amaryllis District's colorful streets. Laughter, clinking glasses, and music assaults my ears from every direction. Yet the most noise still comes from the wet wick. Its doors hang open, lanterns lit. Here we are. He moves towards the door, and Min lets out an audible huff. Don't tell me you're going in. I have some quick business with Leander. Ugh, fine. He still owes me for yesterday's work. He dragged our feet, reluctantly trailing me into the tavern. Well, as soon as the doors open, a wave of sticky heat rolls over me. In the hours since I left, the wick has grown suffocatingly crowded. Kura stands out, easily a head taller than most. Even so, I nearly lose sight of him amid the sea of swarming bodies. Pardon me. The crowd parts as though answering his request. Kuras glances over his shoulder at Min and me before gliding through. How can anyone breathe in here? Min follows Kuras at a clip pace. Leander is right where I left him. Although he's straight up places with a bartender, he holds a pair of shot glasses filled to the brim with luminous green liquid. And now for the finishing touch. A flash of magic paints the glasses white with frost. You're never gonna guess what's in these. Leander slides the glasses across the bar, and I get my third and fourth shocks of the evening in rapid succession. Ice leans against the bar, an elbow propped up on the counter. He catches the glasses and lifts one to the light before turning it upside down. The contents, magically congealed, stay firmly in place. You're supposed to make drinks, pretty boy. Don't tell me you're wasted already. There. Perched on the bar's counter beside, Ice takes a single look at the shot glasses and shakes his head. What have we here? A bucket full of boogers. Leander's nose treasure. You've eaten worse. 
Vera's lips twitch and his ears flatten when Ice offers him a glass. He turns his cheek with a sniff, and Ice just snickers. Coward. Don't tell me you're actually. In one fluid motion, Ice throws back his head and downs the shot. Drinking that? A dark look crosses Ice's face. It's chewy. Chewy. Wait, let me try again. Behind me, Mid grumbles. I told you, this place was a nest of degenerates. If it isn't Kuras and Min. At the sound of Leander's voice, Min's pale eyes grow wide. They look ready to bolt until Kuras sets a hand on their shoulder. I promise, this will not take long. Min's eyes dart from Kuras's hand to his face, then soften. Fine, you first. While he stepped forward, I linger behind, struck by a sudden revelation. All of the people I've met today know each other. Good evening, Leander. Ice, another drinking competition, I presume. Oh, is it evening already? Could have sworn it was earlier. Just some friendly rivalry, Doctor. Nothing to be afraid of. Kuras acknowledges Leander and Ice with a slight nod, ignoring Vera entirely. Now that Veer seemed to mind. He tilts his head and an impish smile curves his lips when he spots Min looming silently behind Kuras. I almost didn't see you there, Min. Looking for your booster seat? Min pushes back their hood. They level Veer with a cool look. They're all so cute, what the heck? I thought Ice wasn't allowed to bring his pets in here. Veer's tail gives an angry twitch. Hey yo! At the first sign of an impending fight, Leander vaults clear over the counter. He slides in between Ice and Kuras. Now, now. Let's try and keep the pace. It's not every day a esteemed doctor takes us up on a drink. His arm snakes around Kuras' shoulder. You are finally taking me up on the drink, right, Kuras? I'm afraid not. We are merely escorting Lion back to their lodgings. Kuras gestures my direction. My stomach sinks. I reluctantly step into the light. As soon as he sees me, Leander's face brightens. Lion! It's been too long. Everyone, this is Lion. They're new to Iridia. I feel five pairs of eyes fix onto me, and suddenly the bar feels suffocatingly small. My voice nearly catches in my throat. Uh, we've already met. Actually, I've already met everyone. You've already met? Ice and Vera level me with subtle, amused expression. Vera's tail gives a lazy wag. We did. Not that long ago either. Uh-huh. I'm starting to suspect they're stalking me. He looks far too pleased with himself that I roll my eyes. This calls for drinks. What does everyone want? In an instant, all eyes turn to Leander, freeing me from the burden of attention. I still can't believe they all know each other. Watching them talk amongst themselves feels surreal. For the first time since I undertook the journey to Iridia, I feel a faint glimmer of hope. I think, no, I know I was meant to meet them. The low, pleasant rumble of Leander's laughter pulls me from my restless thoughts. Huh, <sighs> well, color me surprise. You make friends fast, Lion. I wouldn't go that far. Well, like acquaintances? A wise man once said that acquaintances are merely friends you haven't shared a drink with yet. A wise man, he said that. Here, last week, I can hear Min's lips curl with distaste from across the bar. Leander clears his throat and continues, unperturbed. Why do I have a feeling that Min is probably just a Cinderella? Like, why do I have a feeling like they are just a bundle of joy underneath all that and that they actually care a lot? <laughs> That's just my guess. It's just a theory. Hey, a game theory. Thanks for watching. It's not over yet, by the way. Let's toast to Lion's health. Care to join in, Doctor? Kuras politely declines with a wave of his hand. How much you, Min? No. Are you... No. A resounding pop pierces the din of the bar. We all turn in the direction of the noise. Vera looks almost bashful as he accepts an overflowing flute from the bartender. Poured from a bottle so old, its label was almost worn blank. They serve champagnes here. Since when? Ver pauses in the middle of licking champagne foam from his fingers with a coy smile. 
You don't mind, do you? In a transformation as impressive as his magic trick, the concern on Leander's face vanishes. He laughs softly. No, be my guest. I know you've got expensive taste. Ha <laughs> ha! Then he shots the bartender a frantic look. I'm bothered or interested in his company. Ice counts his head at me, a light smile on his lips. How about you, Sparrow? I did say I'd buy you a drink earlier. No, no, my treat. Ice regards Leander over the lip of his glass. In the dim light, the glint of his crimson eyes looks downright dangerous. Will it be, Lion? I'll take that drink. I'll take you up on the drink, as long as it's not one of those green shots. Don't knock him too, try them. They taste better than they look. Somehow I doubt that, but I hold my tongue long enough for Leander to go behind the bar. He's lying, isn't he? When I glanced at Ice, he only shrugs. Like I said, they're very chewy. Probably poison, too. He considers his own drink, a tumbler of amber-colored whiskey. Leander's tried to kill me a dozen times now. It's always a gamble. Ver clicks his tongue in disapproval. When he finally looks my way, it's with a half-lidded gaze softened by his third glass of champagne. Were I were you, I wouldn't let Leander put anything in my mouth. He fans his fingers over his chest, voice dripping with fake reverence. The wet wick is one of the finest drink establishments in all of Iridia. While you're here, you may as well partake of the signature watered-down drinks and stale nut leather. He sweeps his hand towards a chipped ceramic bowl filled with spindly speckled jerky that I can only assume is nut leather. What is with the food in this city? As abysmal as you make it sound, this place is completely packed. It's not bad at all. Depending on the day, the food's edible. Ice takes a measured sip of his drink. You gotta stick around for the real attraction, though. Before I can ask what he means, Leander returns with a tumbler that he sets up in front of me, and even chunks of ice bobs in a pool of reddish purple alcohol. I sniff the drink suspiciously. To my relief, this time all I smell is the sharp, clean scent of gin with an undercurrent of fermented fruit. Relax, it's just a local specialty. Plum gin. Also, if you're feeling more adventurous. I shake my head. Leander wraps his knuckle against the bar until the group falls silent. All right, everyone, let's toast. May Lion Stay in Iridia be full of bright adventures and discovery. Cheers! Leander, Ice, and Veer raise their glasses in union. Min only crosses their arms, and Kuras watches with polite indifference. I tip back my drink. The plum gin is eye-wateringly strong. Despite a sharp medicinal edge, it goes down smooth. One sip softened the edges of my vision. The next fades the din of the crowded bar into a low, persistent murmur. I find myself unwinding for what feels like the first time in years. Aren't you the popular one, Lion? I'm guessing you met Kuros first. It would be more accurate to say I found them. You saved my life. I merely performed my duty as a doctor. Also, I must admit, I was confused when I woke up missing all my clothes. Leander makes a choked noise. <laughs> Somewhere behind him, Min sighs. It's not what you think! Lion was in grave condition. I could hardly treat such injuries through tattered clothes. The silence that follows stretches uncomfortably long. I look away, unable to face Kura's disappointment, and catch Veer snickering behind his hand. That's my cue to change to the topic. Kuras isn't the only one to save me today. Don't you listen. I didn't save you. You were simply there. That's Min for you. Leander reaches for Min, but they duck under his arm with practice ease, without so much as looking his way. As reliable as they are moody. You don't want to talk, considering you neglected to warn them to stay off the streets at night. Uh, uh, might have gotten distracted. Min's only response is a short breath. At any rate, I never got a chance to thank you, Min. Don't be. The less soul is alive, the better. For a heartbeat. Min's eyes flicker towards Ice, and their lips twist. Ice is too busy nodding along to various enthusiastic pantomime was stabbing to notice, lost no doubt in an enthralling discussion. I've had enough of this hellhole. Let's go. Min and Kuras shares a brief look, then the doctor speaks up. Very well. But there is something I must discuss with Leander, if you'll excuse us, Lion. And just like that, the three of them depart, leaving me alone to savor my gin in silence. Or so I thought, until I hear a voice so soft and low it's practically a purr. Is it fear? 
Lost it to your guide? God freaking damn it. I turned to find crimson and pink eyes trained on me. It's not lost on me that they chose the instant the others left to strike. Just my luck. I had to be abandoned with the two most irritating people I've met all day. Monsters or not, there's no telling what I'll do if either of them push me again. Don't tell me Leander already snuck off to get his knob slobbered out back. He's got business with Kuros and Min. Two on one business? Mmm, isn't that lucky? I can't tell if it's the champagne or the company, but Vare has grown noticeably more relaxed. He sits with his chin propped on the back of his hand. His ears twitch whenever a hiccup shakes his shoulder. Why are you so far away? Come, join us. He pats the empty bar stool beside ice, but I hesitate. The smile Vare swears is sweet and distinctly sly. With the drinks that it makes, I dread how he and Ice will mess with me next. We don't buy. I'm not sure about that. Just hours ago, he tried to rob me, and you threatened me. Me? Steal? Surely, you must be mistaken. Hmm. You sure it was me? Yes, it was you, and then you had the gall to kick me out just so you could go drinking. He gives another one of his shrugs. I was lonely. A simpler answer than I expected. But I guess I can't fault him for that. Vera suddenly slumps forward, Gosmer's sleeves pulling where he rests his elbow on his knees. I sets his hand on Bear's waist, narrowly preventing him from tipping off the counter. How about we start fresh, huh? Begin with proper introductions. Get off on the right foot and whatnot. I'll start. The name's Vera, Hunter Extraordinaire. Vera's right hand flutters to his chest and he bows his head flinching when hair falls into his eyes. Eyes doesn't say anything, so I suppose it's my turn now. Uh, it's Lion. Bear considers me for a long moment, his tail idly swinging behind him. Then he knocks back the rests of his champagne. It's a pleasure to formally meet you, Lion. He says my name slowly and deliberately, savoring every syllable. A tingle jumps down my spine. I quickly turn my gaze away. I smiles at my reaction over the rim of his glass. Something funny? Hmm, no. I open my mouth and close it just as quickly. They want me to react, goading me into another ridiculous game. While their sharp, cat-like eyes keep me on edge, something about this tension is fun. Must meet a gin. A flash of white over Ice's shoulder catches my eye. Across the bar, Kuras heads for the door. I don't see Leander or Min. It feels wrong to let him leave without saying goodbye. I'll be back. Vera hums and wags his finger at me as I leave. I slip through the crowd, careful not to touch anyone, just as I'm nearing Kuras. Gah! I stagger, shoulder checked by a man with neck thicker than both my thighs. He stares down at me, nostrils flaring. Out of my way, poop stain. I words spill out on their own. You watch it! I regret them as soon as they leave my mouth. That freaking gin. The roughneck wheels around, shoving a bloodhound out of the way so it can close in on me. What did you say? He shoves me backwards, sending me tumbling to the sticky floor. I'm fine, but my heart leaps into my throat when I see the roughneck bearing down on me. You try to start something here? The roughneck freezes, his fists cocked back. A group of bloodhounds called... By the commotion circle him, sizing him up. For what feels like an agonizingly long moment, the roughneck looks from me to the bullet hounds. Finally, he sniffs and spits on the floor next to me. The lob nearly misses my cheek. Screw it. Too many freaks in the circus tonight. He turns his back on me. And come face to face with ice. A dangerous smile spreads across his face. He'll do. What happens next is a blur. Ice fist crashes into the roughneck's jaw, causing an eruption of gas, shouts, and even cheers around us. I scramble to my feet, rise the frantic crowd swarms around me, cutting off my sight of everything and everyone. Through the ruckus, I hear Leander shouting. Hey, hey, Ice, take it outside! Ignore them. Everyone, look! Drinks are on me! With those four words, the wake erupts into hoots and hollers. The ring around me disperses as bloodhounds and onlookers rush towards the bar. Through the thinning crowd, I catch glimpses of familiar faces. Ice vanishes out the back, dragging the rough neck behind him. Kuros lingers near the door, searching, I suspect, for any wounded before he departs. Min draws their hood up tight as they slip out the side door. 
while Vera leans over the counter to swipe a glass of wine from behind the bar. And Leander, seated at the opposite end of the bar, gestures dramatically and apologetically at the bartender. In the space of a heartbeat, I realize that there is no telling when or if I'll see any of them ever again. Whoever I pursue may be the last person I get to speak to tonight. I follow... Ah, frick! Leander, Veer, Min, Curas, Ice... I like Leander! Hmm... I like Leander. For the second time today, I find myself squeezing through the crowd to reach Leander. As soon as he sees me, his easy smile fades. You're right, Lion. I'm not used to someone looking at me with such earnest concern. I've been through worse today. From the sounds of it, you've had quite a day. Are you holding up? Uh, could be better. Not bad, considering I've been threatened, robbed, and come close to dying too many times to count. Should have known not to let you out of my sight. How about the next time you want to see the city? I'll come along. I can be your personal guide. You've already helped me more than enough. Leander signals for the bartender. I'm parched. Do you want anything? I'll have a drink. Something strong and simple. Adventurous, aren't you? I'm gonna have to keep an eye on you. Of course, you'll also need to keep an eye on me. I lost count of how many I've had. Deal. Once he's ordered, Leander turns back to me. Did you at least try to get any good food? I had those fried dough sticks from a vendor near here. As soon as I began describing my meal, his eyes brightened with recognition. The long lads from Wind Stall. You've got to try my porridge. There's another stall about a block away with those rose water rice flour cakes. Take one bite and you think you'll be transported to some high town patisserie. Then bam, you open your eyes in the same trash lined street as always. When he laughs, his hair falls over his eyes. He shakes his head and pushes it back. I'll show you sometime, if you decide to stick around Low Town, that is. Iridia, Leander describes, is far different from the one I've experienced, but if you live anywhere long enough, I suppose it becomes home. Seems like I'll be here for a while. Maybe I'll take you up on that. Bartender returns with a pair of glasses and pushes them our way. Cheers! Leander clinks his glass against mine. I take a deep sip of the malty dark ale, savoring its flavor. It was... Surprising, finding out that you all know each other. I didn't think Iridia would be so small. Do you know how many times I tried getting them all in one place? It's impossible. I tried to hurt a bunch of soulless. I take it you know them well? Depends. Is there anyone you're curious about in particular? Um, well, okay. Men, Kura's eyes. Ver? Curious about Ver? What do you know about Ver? Leander shakes his head slowly, his expression grave. Vare, a living example of the Cenobium's cruelty. Most days, they keep him on a short leash. I'm surprised you ran into him. So tell me, what'd you make of him? Eh, wanna know more. Wanna know more about him? Wounds we all. It's mysterious. Not because the Cenobium keeps him locked up. It's the way they treat him. Just not right. Do you know why he's a prisoner? Nobody knows. He's been in prison for as long as anyone remembers, but whatever he did must have been awful considering the punishment. He's charming, but like any monster, he's dangerous. If you ever see him out hunting, you'll know what I mean. Leander swirls his glass, choosing his next words carefully. Don't fall as far as looks, he'll whip your throat out just for fun. Uh, what about Min? Min's interesting. Not very forthcoming, though. Ah, Min, my favorite grouchy freelancer. What's your impression of them? Ah, uh, they seem lonely. Get the feeling they could use a friend. I think Min prefers to be alone. What makes you say that? I've known them since they arrived to Iridia. They've turned down every attempt I've made. Well, almost every attempt. He trails off to take a deep swig of his drink. Anyway, I'm just saying, if Min wanted to be your friend, you'd know. Uh, what about Kuras? You and Kuras work together. Occasionally. Did the mysterious competent doctor catch your eye? He seems like a good person. He seems like a good person, though it's hard to believe anyone's a good person these days. That's Kiras. He works hard to serve the people of Lowtown. He's a miracle worker, even if his bedside matter could use some work. Do you think he might be able to cure my curse? Leander starts to speak, but pauses to consider me for a moment. Kiras is good, but he's only a doctor. Besides, Unless you're actively dying, he'll make you wait in line all day like everyone else. Ice. 
So, your friends of ice? I've been for a while, but he's rarely in town. Where'd you run into him? The sea spring. Leander chokes on his drink. He calls violently into his fist before giving me a surprised look. He went all the way out there? How'd he treat you? He was up front. He was honest. Told me how the sea spring's power comes with a heavy price. Lose your mind. Becoming one of his funny, brainless pets. He sighs, pausing before he speaks again. Does that sound worth it to you, Lion? The only pets he has are all soulless. Yeah, I know. Didn't mean it like that. Eyes has my respect and takes care of his own. For a moment, Leander stares deep into the bottom of his glass. When he looks up again, the circles under his eyes seem deeper than usual. All those red-eyed minions creep me out. We talk about someone else? That about covers it. Aren't you tired of standing? Let's find you somewhere to sit. Leander pushes away from the bar, beckoning me to follow him. Where are we going? He leads me to a small booth, hidden in the nook of the bar. A pair of bloodhounds notice him and immediately leap to their feet, offering their seats to us. As I slide into the booth, a web of graffiti scratched onto the booth's tabletop catches my eye. The deepest groove formed the outline of a dog from Leander's posters, dozens of roughly etched names surrounding the drawing, some fresh, some well-worn. What's all this? It's a tradition. Whenever someone joins the bloodhounds, they have a drink of us, and then they carve in their initials. The barkeeper must love that. After the first year, she finally stopped charging me extra for damages. Two years and countless drinks later, she added her own name. You're not planning on recruiting me, are you? He quickly shakes his head. Not yet. You need to have some time to think about your own path. Do you know what you're going to try next? The question gives me a pause. I take my hands out from under my cloak and rest them on the table. You think you can help me? Of course. We can find answers together. Leander starts to reach for me, as though meaning to take my hat before stopping himself. His eyes flicker to mine. I won't fail you, Lion. And if you ever need a taste of normalcy, I'll always be here for you. My chest tightens at the memory of touching him. Even now? Leander swallows. The table groans under his elbows as he leans forward. The booth is so narrow that he completely blocks my view of the bar counter. It's almost as though Leander and I are completely alone. If that's what you want. How did it make you feel? It was warm. Exciting. Don't know how to f I don't know how to describe it. Leander rests his hands on the table. He looks at me, smiling when I place my hand on his. Slowly, he begins unwinding the bandages, stopping every so often to glance at me. As my skin becomes visible, I cast a nervous glance around the bar. As far as I can see, no one's paying us any attention. Leander squeezes my hand gently. No one will notice. He pulls back, raising his hand to his mouth so he can tug his glove off with his teeth. Hot? The muscles in his forearms tighten as he flexes his fingers. Our eyes meet, and Leander offers his hand again. There you go. Hand holding on to man. A lump forms in my throat. I'm certain Leander can see it on my face, a flicker of desperation. His voice lowers to a whisper. Anything you want, Lion? I will touch his face! I am going to touch his face! I blurt out the first request that comes to mind. Can I touch your face? Oh, sure. I lean over the table, hesitating before I reach for his face. My fingers graze his jaw. Leander laughs softly. It tickles. It's fine. You can just... It takes my wrist, angling my hand so he can press his cheek into my palm. Warmth spreads under my fingertip. A surprised breath escapes me. Gently, I run my thumb down the ridge of his scar on his cheek, and he shudders, his earring jingling against my knuckles. You're getting awfully bold. I never touched someone like this before. Even though it makes my head spin, it's already not enough. I want to be even closer. My heart hammers filling my ears with a pulse that grows unbearably loud until I put my hand back. Are you alright? I can barely hear his words over my pounding heart, but managed to nod. Yeah, I'm fine. Sorry, I think I'm just getting a bit dizzy. He gives me a gentle smile, eyes crinkling at the edge. You've had a long day. You deserve some rest. Luckily, your room is just upstairs. Want me to walk you back? I shake my head and begin wrapping my hand back up. With each deep breath, my head feels more clear. I'm fine. But thanks for... Well, everything. Remember what I told you. If you ever need a break from the chaos of the city, I'll be here for you. And I rise, Leander gives me one last smile. Good night, Lion. 
Good night. I trudge up the stairs, but even as I leave Leander behind, the warmth of his skin lingers on mine, burning through the bandages. Oh. I, uh, wait, what? I'm gonna make a save here. I guess, considering I was already going down Leander's route, might as well go with Leander. Leander offers you something that should be possible. A taste of normalcy, free from every curse. As the first person to withstand your touch, he could simply change your life. But some things are simply too good to be true. Leander promises to help unravel your curse, but at what cost? Ah. <sighs> Vera serves as a warning of the dangers posed by the Cenobium. As cunning as he is curious, Vera finds you fascinating and insists that he can help. But trusting him means entrusting a life to a colored beast with a lethal reputation. Can Vera protect you, or are his honeyed words a trap waiting to snap shut? Ice, an intimidating yet laid-back outsider. Ice presides over a sea spring with unnerving powers. He offers you a miracle, but the price means submitting itself to the horrifying presence at the heart of the sea spring. Will you gaze into the abyss for answers, even at the risk of losing yourself? Kuras. From all appearances, Kuras is a principal doctor of extraordinary skills. <sighs> but you know little about the man underneath the professional mask, and Kuras keeps his friends at a cool distance. Will you uncover his deepest secret? Will you like what you find? Min. Despite their cold nature and familiarity of violence, Min is just as desperate as you to get into the Cenobium. You may be able to help each other, but they're keeping as many secrets as you. They claim they're dangerous, but could they be your only chance into getting into the Cenobium? It could either... Honestly, I would go for either Min or Leander at this point. No way in heck I'm ever choosing Ice. I like him, but like, giving myself up is not something I'm into. So, I'll go with Leander. Oh. Oh boy, that was the ending. Huh. Anyway, that was Touch Starve. Thank you guys so much for watching. We will be back with more of Touch Starve once the final game is released. I know that this episode is ridiculously long, but uh, once the final game is released, I'm thinking of doing like an hour for each episode. We'll, we'll see how it turns out. But anyway, hope you guys have a lovely rest of the day. And of course, I will be seeing you in the next video. This is Lion, signing off. Ciao.